There's a verse of scripture in the Old Testament where the, the psalmist says, I was glad when they said to me to go to the house of the Lord today. And the joy of the Lord is my strength, and laughter is good medicine. Let, let me just tell you, I, th I think that's a good thing. All right? Yes. So, you know, may, may, we, may, may we laugh as much as we weep, and, and may we laugh as much as we're sad, whatever. But uh, being, being here is, is, a, is a good thing. And uh, uh, I, just, I just felt like I wanted to, wanted to say that this morning. There was a, a minister that was, actually it was a ministerial group that was opposing a, a disreputable business that had opened up in town near a school. Uh, you can just imagine what that might have been, but they, they, these groups of ministers, they, they, were, they were opposed to having this type of business that close to the school, and the, the contention got so to the point where there was, it led to a court case and so there was that legal fighting going on and off, and, and uh, the, uh, the defense attorney was trying to intimidate the ministers. And so there in, in the courtroom one day, the defense attorney uh, called forward on, for, on, up on the stand, the, this quote spokesman, the spokesman uh, minister for the minister's group. And uh, when the minister had, had taken his seat, he asked him, he says, now you're a pastor, is that right? Yes, yes I am. Now, um, is I understand that the word pastor means to shepherd, and the minister said, "Yes, I, I'm. That's what it means. I'm a shepherd." And so the the uh, attorney went on to say, "Well, then, why aren't you out there today shepherding your flock rather than here?" And I guess he thought he had the preacher. Thought he had it with the minister. He just said, "Well, sometimes you just got to fight the wolves." <laughs> And really, that's where we are today when, in our position here in, in the book of Colossians because the Apostle Paul is, is aware that there are some people that you might want to call wolves. And I, I got to tell you, there are people in our culture today that are looking at the church and they are looking to intimidate, they're looking to take out, they're looking to distract us, they're looking to discourage us. And I would hope that we would take the same advice that the Apostle Paul gave to the church in, in Colossians and applied to our own life, applied to our own situation, um, because we can be led away and led astray in so many ways. But what we had here in, in the first century, there was a group of people that, by and large, there were two different, two different types, but one of the biggest ones. But what they wanted to do is they wanted the, the Christians to have sort of a written code of what you had to do and the things that you weren't allowed to do if you were to become a Christian. And the problem with much of it was it was not scriptural. Uh, it it, it just, just was not. And, the, and when you buy into a list like that, what we end up with is what you might want to call a counterfeit religion. And, and, I, I, and I, I think this is, this is very important and I hope you get it today. I hope, I hope this sinks in. I hope you understand what I'm trying to communicate because there are people today that they have in their mind, in their heart, and they may be even well-intentioned. Some extra restrictions that they want to place upon you and upon me if, if we are to follow Jesus. And they want us to live in fear and they want us to live in guilt. And, and, and this is why this is so critical to me. I would say in the last 15 or 20 years, I've become very much aware. Now, now maybe it was in, my, in the people that I served before that, but as I've gotten older, I, I, I hope to God that I've picked up a few more sensitivities to things. But, but I've noticed as I talk to many older believers that at some point, maybe we get into their home and uh, there's some illness that they're facing and, and things like that, and, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll pull out a handkerchief and start wiping tears from their eyes and they'll start doing this with their hands. And here's what they'll say. They say, I hope I have been good enough. I hope I have done enough good things. I said, what are you talking about? I knew what they were talking about, but I wanted them to say it. They said, I hope I've been good enough to get into heaven. I hope that I've been good enough and I've done enough good things that, that God will let me in. I was talking about this with Sally on the way up here today, and, and I told her, I said, when that is said to me, my mind thinks two things. And one of them is the smart aleck in me. 
And the smart aleck wants to say, where have you been? But the shepherd in me wants to say, well, let's just open up the word. Let me just show you what the scripture teaches. And what the scripture teaches is this, for God so loved the world that he gave. It doesn't say that God loved the world enough that he held back and waited till we got our act together before he did anything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I'm way off on my slides already. Okay, uh, Tiffany, just let you know that. So just hang in there with me. And I'm way off on what the outline has, but just, I'm still in the introduction. But I just want you to get this. And, 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 and then also in Romans, the, the scripture tells us, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't after we got perfect. It wasn't after we, once again, got our act together. It wasn't after we, we, we earned it or earned his favor because there that's, that's what this group was wanting to try to convince the Colossian church of. You've got to earn God's favor. And apparently that baggage is hanging on to our world today because there are a lot of Christians that still think, I hope I've been good enough. I hope I've done you know, the right things. And uh, so Paul is, is, is giving the people a warning here. And uh, and in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, the warning you want to let them know is there are false teachers that want to control you. And uh, let's just read Colossians 2, verses 6 through 8. Let me see if I can find it. My eyes are still adjusting. He said, okay, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it then that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of, of this world rather than on Christ. And he's saying, hey, just like you received in the beginning, hang on to that and follow Jesus and don't be caught. And he mentions two words here. Uh, he mentions the word captive and he mentions the word uh, deceptive. What's happening is some people are wanting to get us to buy in to legalism. You ever been a part of a legalistic group? It is very restrictive. Very, very, very restrictive. And that's what Paul is trying to tell them here. There's, there's some people out there that are wanting you to become legalistic and to give you a bunch of rules and regulations that really aren't scriptural. Basically, they want you to understand two things. They want you to think... If I'm a Christian, I, I know I'm a Christian because I don't do these things. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, in my early days as a Christian, I was given a list of rules, not, not literally on a piece of paper, but it, it's sort of, you know, different people would mention things to me. I was given a list of rules I never heard of before. Okay, now, buddy, now if you're a Christian, you can't go here. You can't do this. You can't listen to that music. You can't listen to that music either. You, you, you've got to do this. And by the way, you know, those get-togethers after the football games on Friday nights there in high school, you can't go to those get-togethers anymore because that's, that's, that's not a good thing. You can't do that. And I thought, I, all I wanted to do was follow Jesus and you're giving me a whole bunch of rules and things like that. And I said, well, that's okay because if you're really serious about following Jesus, then you have to do these things. Every time the church door is open, you've got to be there. You've got to read so much of the Bible every day. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. And, and I thought, I'm being overwhelmed with all these rules and all these regulations. Anybody have been there? Oh, okay. So some of you don't know what I'm talking about. And Paul is saying, hey, hang on, folks. Don't let these people take you captive. Don't let them deceive you. That word captive, that's in verse 7. Verses 6 and 7 there, uh, it's, it's a military term that's talking about soldiers that were defeated in a battle. They were stripped of their rank. They were stripped of their weapons. They were stripped of all of, of their spoils that they had, all their possessions. And, and they, they had absolutely nothing. And basically, they were, they were kidnapped. And Paul is saying, don't let anybody kidnap you in your faith unknowingly. Now, let me just mention to you that, uh, that there, are, uh, there are at least three traps that sometimes we just sort of step into, and it's because of our culture, it's because of the world that, that we're living in, to, in today. You know, one of those uh, traps is intellectualism, where there are people try to intimidate us by saying, you believe the Bible? Are you kidding me? 
That book is 2,000 years old. It was written by a bunch of men over a bunch of period of time, and you believe that Bible? Don't you know it's full of mistakes? Don't you know it's full of errors? I at least have gotten to the point where I've got enough brass now when somebody says that to me. I will say, well, well here, please, show me one of them. Yeah. Now, show me one of the errors. Oh, well, don't you know that, you know, there's some places that uh, uh, they mention in Scripture that, they, that archaeology has never found yet. And I say, well, yeah, but did you hear about this one that they found? Did you hear about this one that they found? Did you hear about this one that they found? I tell you, archaeology is discovering all the time and verifying what the Scripture says about history. Even though the Scripture is not necessarily a history book, it very much is. And, and it documents what what the scripture has to say to us. And, and but people in their intellectual thoughts, they'll say, you really believe the, the Bible? If you have your Bible with you, how about turn back a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Um, 1 Corinthians is about, oh, maybe four books in front of uh, Colossians where we are, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. I, I love this passage here because Here's what it tells us. It says, for the message of the cross of Christ is foolishness to those who are perishing. Basically, there are people who hear the gospel and they go, that is so foolish. That is so dumb. That is so stupid. Why would anybody step out of heaven if heaven really exists? And why would he come down here and die for you and die for us? This, this whole thing, the gospel is foolishness. But notice what it says here. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, to those who don't accept the gospel, the gospel, it sounds foolish, but to you and me who know the gospel and know Jesus, it is a powerful thing. It, it is a good thing. And so, you know, they try to, uh, to, to trap us, and so sometimes we buy into it because we let ourselves get intimidated. But another thing that uh, another trap we walk into would be materialism, where it's, it's got to be more and more and more and more, and we get caught up and, uh, and, and getting more. And, and, you know, I found this that the more I have, the more I have to maintain. And the more I have, the more I have to fix. And the more I have, the more I have to ensure. My possessions end up owning me. Anybody found that to be true? But we sometimes get caught into that, into materialism. And, uh, and, and the reason that's the case is because those who have no eternal hope, their thought and their thinking is, be drink and be merry, because tomorrow, I'm dead, and I'm gone, and I am no more. There used to be a bumper sticker. I don't see it so much anymore, but it used to be on a lot of cars. It says, he who dies with the most toys wins. I liked the one that came out a couple years after that. It said, he who dies with the most toys wins nothing. <laughs> and that's, that was really, you know, the, the, the truth when it came, when it comes down to that. And, and then the, the last trap we fall into is, is humanism. Now that's the dominant one of our day. We hear it all the time. We may not recognize it as that, but basically it's this, that man is his own God. Because I am my own God, I determine what's right and wrong when I want it to be right and wrong. There's no absolutes except what I feel, what I believe. Are we smacked in the face with that every day? Every day. Our culture is hitting us with it every time we turn around, every time we turn on the radio or the TV, it's hitting us with it. And some of the big news is, well, you know, uh, this is who I identify as today. This is who I identify as, you know, yesterday. And it goes, oh, it's all because I believe this is, this is what I feel. This is what I want. And so it's, it's humanism. It's what I want it to be. And right and wrong is what I want it to be. But so Paul is warning them don't let these false teachers lead you away. And it brings us a, a little further here. He gives them a reminder. And uh, the reminder he wants them to know is that Jesus Christ is the source of freedom. Now, he frees us in two ways. We've got there on, on your outline. He frees us from the bondage of sin. We'll take a look at that. And also, he frees us from the burden of the law. Now, initially, sin promises us all sorts of fun. Initially, sin promises us all sorts of fulfillment. But in the end, it brings us pain. And I'll use this word. It brings us addiction. 
there are, we are such an addicted culture. We're ad addicted to, to drugs, we're addicted to drink, we're addicted to television, we're addicted to this thing right here, uh -huh. right? Yeah. This thing right here. Uh, isn't it crazy when uh, you go out maybe to a restaurant and there's four people at the table and all four of them are sitting there looking at this? <laughs> or what's worse is when there are two of them at the table and you assume that there's a husband and wife and both of them across one another are looking at this thing here and think, talk to one another. And they're texting. You know? But we are a culture that's just full of addiction. But but initially, sin is like that. It, it, it promises us fun, but it brings us all sorts of addictions. But besides that, I got there, there are other addictions that'll take your life. I mean, some addictions will destroy your family. It'll destroy your income. It'll destroy your work. It'll destroy your faith. Uh, but it, 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 some will take your life. But Jesus sets us free. And that's one thing Paul wanted to remind them. Jesus is the source of freedom, and he will free us from the bondage of sin. Now, initially, when we are confronted with the gospel, it, it almost looks like it's overwhelming. It almost looks like it's too much. It's looked like, can anybody do this? Well, the answer is yes and no. Can anybody become a Christian? The answer is yes. Can anybody live the perfect life? The answer is no. Jesus was sent here in our behalf because we fail and because he lived the perfect life. And uh, but really, when you first look at being a Christian, it just seems so restricted because we look at Jesus and he was perfect and we're not, and we know that. But in the end, the Christian life gives us the freedom that actually we're, we're looking for. Let me show you here how he does that, you know, for us. And uh, verses 9, uh, we'll start with verse 9 and read on down. He says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. I mentioned to you, Jesus is God in a body. And so he came to earth, and he came to show us how to live, and he came to defeat that which defeats us. And so then we go to verse 10, and he says, And you, talking about you as believers, and me as believer, you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and every authority. There is no power, no sin that Jesus Christ cannot overcome. Now, before I read this next verse, I'm going to read it, and if you've never read it before, you're liable to say, what is that doing here? Let's go and take a look at it. And it says, in him you are also circumcised, and in, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with circumcision decision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Sometimes, when, first time I read that, I scratched my head, I don't get it. I don't understand. Here, here's, see if I can summarize it, because a lot of us, we never get this either. When God called Abraham to follow him, and Abraham obeyed, God told Abraham, I want this to be a mark. I want this to be a symbol that you belong to me. And I want all of your descendants to have this surgery done, this circumcision done, the cutting of the way of the flesh as, as a mark that you are my follower. But as is typically true with you and I, there came a point when the Jews, they let that mark, they let that surgery, that circumcision become the end in itself. They said, oh yeah, of course I'm a follower of God because I, you know, I had that done when I was eight years old. Or yes, I'm a follower of God because, and, and yet it hadn't changed their life at all. How often have we been guilty of saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian because on such and such a date I joined the church. On such and such a date I was baptized. On such and such a date I rededicated my life. But yet it has made no difference in our life whatsoever. That's what Paul is talking to us about. He's saying we are not people who have just gone through the acts because God wants to take and cut the sin out of our heart because we've been transformed. We have been made new. And you go, but when did that happen? Look at verse 12. He says, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When did it happen? It happened when we went through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Because he's telling us it was at this point 
It was at this point that we stood before God and we said, Lord, Lord, I die to myself. I yield to you. I surrender to you. And in the same way that Christ died and was buried and rose again, I want that. I want my old self to die, my sinful nature to die, and I want to follow you. There was a commentator by the name of William Barclay, and here's what he said about this passage and about baptism. He says, baptism in the time of Paul was three things. It was adult baptism, meaning they were old enough to make a decision for themselves, and now we don't make a decision for them. It was instructed baptism, that means they were taught what it was and what it meant, and it was total immersion. As the waters closed over the man's head, it was as if he died and was buried. As he rose from the cleansing waters, it was as if he rose to life anew. His old life was dead, the new life stretched in front of him. Part of him was dead and gone forever, but he was a new man risen in a new life. And so basically Paul wants the people to know, hey, Christ brings us freedom. And he gives us freedom from the bondage of sin, but that's only half the good news. The other half is he frees us from the burden of the law. And once again, I'm not so sure that we grasp this one very well either because sometimes we just don't know. And I want to see if you can, can follow that with me because once again, how many people think I want to please God, I want to earn God's favor, and I want God to, to love me? Go down to verse 14. He had just said, let me do the last part of verse 13. God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sin, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it, nailing it on, on the cross. Jesus took that Old Testament code, got rid of it, and said, it is not yours to have to follow. Verse 15, and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus disarmed that old code. I hadn't intended to do this. Let me just ask. Have, have any of you here in some part of your walk with Christ walked around feeling guilty about yourself? Okay. Yeah. All right. Here it's telling us Christ got rid of, got rid of that. He put it, he, he buried it, he canceled it. It no longer ought to plague us. When, when I was a new Christian and I was trying to quote, get my act together, not that I was way off base, but I was trying to get my act together. Uh, you know, I want to think my prayers to God was, God, anytime I step out of line, I want you to tell me, I want you to convict me. Later on, I realized God didn't want me to do that to him. Because what God wants to do, he wants to set me free of guilt, not lay it on me. And so sometimes we ask God to do things that really, that, that's not what he wants to do. He wants to free us from the guilt. He wants to free us from the sin. And we just read there that Christ disarmed it. Um, and, he, and he canceled that. Now, that does not mean we don't have commands to obey. That doesn't mean that we don't have, that we don't have that there are no commands today. But it does mean that I don't have to keep them perfectly as much as I try. I just don't have to keep them perfect. Let me just give you an example here. Back in 1933, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, they began construction on that bridge. Anybody ever been over there? Anybody driven across it? You've seen it? Okay. Uh, that, that it is a huge bridge, and it's several sections, and there are several thousand feet of that bridge spanning across, you know, the, the, the bay there. And in 1933, when they began it, they had a target date of when they were going to finish, and when, by the time they were half completed building that bridge, and by the way, it's a double-decker uh, bridge, and you can be as high as five, over 500 feet above the water. They were about halfway done with it, and they stopped to do some calculations. They said, no, wait, we've, we've got to stop for a while because in this time period, we've had, many, we've had 20 men fall from the structure into the waters below, and they died. 
So they, they lost 20 workers in that period of time. And they, they tried to figure out how, what could they do about that. And they decided to put a net under the structure as they were building it so that if anybody fell, the net would catch them and they would be able to proceed with their work without any, any tragedies that way. And so they, they built the net, finished the bridge, and interestingly enough, in, in the next period of time it took to finish the bridge, they did it 25% quicker than they had before. And they only had eight men fall and none of them died because the net caught them. What happened was, the net gave them a sense of security. It enabled them to do their work and to do their work well and not work in fear of every day when they went to work that this might be my last day of life. And they, they would be fear of falling, fear of injury, fear of losing their family, losing their own life. But with that net there, the fear was gone. And in a very real sense, God wants to remove the fear from your heart and your soul that you haven't earned his favor, that you haven't earned his love. But let me just assure you, God loves you, period. Period. Now, we have some garbage we need to get rid of, and he works with us on it. And when Christ is living inside of us, he helps us to take, take care of that. One other story I want to tell you, and then we'll move on to the last part here. And, and that is, years ago, in, in a church that I, I was serving, one of our youth sponsors came to me and said, hey, but the, but the teenagers right now, we are going through a Bible study on Wednesday night, and, and I have a question, because I don't understand this passage. And he started reading this passage, and it, and it was Galatians, Colossians, or it was talking about the law. And he said, is this telling me I don't have to obey the law of the land? And I said, well, Rick, tell me what you're talking about. You know, tell me, what, what do you mean? And he said, okay, All right, does this, because it says I'm free from the law, I'm not obligated to the law, the law has been canceled, does that mean that I can jump in my car and I can disobey all the speed limits? And I can disobey all the stop signs? And I said, that's not what that means. This, and, I, and I saw his problem. He thought it meant the law of our land. And I said, no, 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 no. This is talking about the Old Testament law, the Old Testament standard of God that has been canceled, that Christ overcame it. We're not obligated to follow it. Yes, we're obligated to try to follow Christ and to be perfect with him or be mature with him, but we're not obligated to follow the Old Testament law. And it was like a light clicked on inside of his head. Said, oh, boy, do I feel dumb now. But you know, sometimes it's okay to ask questions like that because we need to have that, that light turned on. And uh, it was just basically, he thought the law, he never thought about the Old Testament law. But God's talking to us about the Old Testament law. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I hope that maybe turned a light bulb on for some of you and some of us here today that didn't understand what he was talking you know, about there. Um, that he, Christ has freed us from the burden of the law. I can't keep God's, old, God's perfect law. I didn't keep God's perfect law. I violated God's perfect law, but that's okay. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And every one of us here can say that same thing. Now, let's go on. Then Paul gives them a word of counsel that uh, they need to see. And, and, and basically that word of counsel was, was this, do not return to your bondage. Don't return to the bondage of, of this to-do list, of this list of, of right and wrong, what people think you need to be doing. Back in the days following uh, the Civil War and following the Emancipation Proclamation, after that Civil War was over with, I understand, history shows us, that there were some slaves that returned to the plantation and returned to their, quote, master and returned and said, I want to serve, I want to continue as a slave. And we would say, why would they want to do that? I mean, they, they, they were free, they were free. Well, some, some masters were, were good and took care of their people. There were others that were not, but I think many of them went back because 
it was comfortable for them. They, they, uh, uh, they, 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 they were familiar with it. And Paul is saying to them, do not get sucked into old religion of a list of do's and don'ts. Because that's not what the gospel is. Now, on your outline, I just want you to see that there are several characteristics that take us back to bondage. And I'll see if I can run through them fairly quickly here. There, number one, there's an emphasis on law and not grace. There are people who say, if you want to really be a good Christian, you have to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And I know I'm hitting on this many times today, but I want you to get it. Paul is saying, no, no, no. Christ wants to free us from that list. He wants us to be able to walk in freedom, be able to walk in joy, and so that we can develop the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and all those things. Rather than thinking, did, 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 I, did I check off my list totally today? No, we're focusing on the wrong thing. And so Paul says, focus on grace, not the law. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. Unless any of us can boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, I, I, could, I could take some time and talk about some things that people say we need to be doing. I, I think that most of us may be beyond that. I do know that there are some people that, I, in, my, in my days of ministry, they said, don't, but don't ever wear a t-shirt and jeans to church. I'm in trouble today. I do think, though, this may be, maybe that the third time in 45 years I've just worn tennis shoes, blue jeans, and t-shirts to church. But uh, I'm getting better at it. But there's some people that say, hey, you, you, you've got to get dressed up. I'm glad we got beyond that. Because it is here. It's what is here. And if God is going to be our Heavenly Father, I didn't have to get dressed up every time I went to see my father. He was my dad. And Jesus called God his heavenly daddy. And our heavenly father is our heavenly daddy. And our relationship should be close enough that we could call him that. And so anyway, there's an emphasis on law and, and not grace. Also, there, sometimes people depend on revelation other than the Bible. They will say, well, you know, I just feel that God led me here. And I just feel that God told me this. And I feel that God told me that. And I had this vision. And I had this, uh, this, this dream. And I, I really believe that this is what God is saying. Let me just tell you, folks, the Bible is the word of God. It is the authority of God. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me find it here quickly and read it to you. Okay, Timothy, don't hide from me. There you go. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and, and 17. He says, All scripture is God breathed, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. Got to tell you, everything we need is right here. What we need is right there. Don't need extra visions. Don't need an extra vision, any revelations and things like that. But we need to trust God. Another thing that happens that leads to bondage into legalism, and that is that uh, there's, they exalt someone other than Christ. If they're holding some leader in, to, in, in, on high on a pedestal, I've heard of churches that they require the membership before you date a person you need to get the approval of the leader of the church. Before you buy a car, before you buy a house, before you make a big expenditure, you go to the leaders and have to get their approval. I, I think that guy thinks a little bit too much of himself. Would you agree with that? And, uh, we answer to God. We answer to him. Yeah, we need to be accountable to people, but not for every move we make. But there are some groups that they exalt somebody other than God. And also others, they emphasize the negative and, and not the positive by simply saying, you can't do this, can't do that. And I've hit that again. Um, and and we, we, we need to move beyond that. And then, um, did I skip one? I think I got them all there. Okay, emphasize the negative rather than the positive. And here's what happens when we fall into legalism. And I'll wrap up with, with this here. 
when we fall, fall into legalism, we focus on rules and then we try to bang up against the boundary line. Back several years ago, when I was working at, uh, uh, I'll save that for a minute here. It's our nature to try to bang up against the edge and figure out how far can I go. And so sometimes we focus on the rules and then try to bang up against, against the edge. It's kind of like the kid that was kicked out of uh, secular school for praying and kicked out of Christian school for cussing. We do both. He did both, but he got caught doing both in the wrong spot. But he knew what the laws were, he knew what the rules were, and yet he violated them anyway. And then the, the last thing that happens here, we, our focus will change from love and freedom to everyone being a detective. Back years ago when I was working at camp, spent a lot of time at church camp, loved church camp, one, one Sunday, one, one week, the leader of the week said, hey gang, we're gonna have a very spiritual week. And here's what we're going to do. He said, guys, if you brought any t-shirts that have any rock bands on them, can't wear them. Not allowed. And girls, if you brought some short skirts and some skimpy two-piece bathing suits, not allowed to wear those. So you're going to have to make sure that your clothing meets our standards. And so what happened? That turned every staff person and every other camper into a little detective. You know what I'm saying? Because they kept looking out for the other guy. Rather than being a group of people that were encouraging somebody else, we, we became little detectives. And, and, and rather than being a spiritual week, it was a horrible week. Now, I was at other camps where the dean or the leader of the week would say, hey, kids, guess what we're going to do? We're going to have a great week. Now, girls, dress modestly. Guys, dress modestly. Don't make me come to you and have to talk to you and say, hey, go change it. But, you know, you know what decent is. You know what modest, modesty is. And, and I hope that's the last I have to mention. It. i got to take me a great week. I agree because his focus was not on a short set skirt. What about that rock group on that T-shirt? Is that a decent clothes, guys? That we you know are wearing, and so we didn't turn into a bunch of detectives. And sometimes we focus on legalism and we just start gossiping. Did you hear that so and so did this? I saw so and so going into this place. I saw so and so going into here. I saw so and so doing doing this. Um, I'm going to tell you an unplanned story, and then I'm done. I know I'm past 12 o'clock, but I got up late. <laughs> I don't mean this morning. I mean in here. But years ago, I was invited to be the chaplain of the local Kiwanis Club where we lived out in, in L.A. Um, and uh, I, I was a friend of one of the men that was uh, in the Kiwanis and, and the, the minister that had been the chaplain, he, he moved away. And so they came to me and said, hey, bud, would you be our chaplain for our Kiwanis Club? We would love it if you would. Here's what we'll do. We meet every Tuesday night. We meet for dinner. And uh, uh, we'd like to ask you to pray. And you sort of serve as our chaplain and our, our pastor. And I said, sure, I'll do that. They said, we'll cover your dues. We'll pay for your meals. I was really in favor of that. And, and so, you know, I, I went and I became a part of, of the Qantas Club. And uh, it just so happened, I didn't know this at the time that I said yes, but um, I, I found out after I became a part of the club, I would, I would go to the dining room that they were going to meet in. I would sit down at the table at the time we were supposed to be there, and I heard them in the next room. Do you know what the next room was? The bar. Okay? And so I thought, no. I'm not going over there. I'm not going to do that. What if somebody sees me go in there? Uh, you know how my names go, stuff like that. And so after several weeks, I uh, would go to the room. I was sitting. I could hear them in the next room. And I came to the realization. I said, God, I told you I wanted to be a part of this group to minister to these men. And Jesus went and dealt with the sinners. And he went where they were. I'm going over in the next room. And so I got up and I went over into the next room and one of the guys said, hey, bud, we wondered how long it'd take you to figure it out. Let me buy you a beer. And I said, that's okay, I'll take a soda. And he bought me a soda. And so I, I did that. And then a couple of months later at an elders meeting, as we were getting ready to adjourn, one, one of the elders said, hey, one, one other thing I want to mention. And, and that is, hey, bud, so-and-so came and told me that they were down here at the Foothill Restaurant, and they saw you walk in the door and walk into the bar. Would you mind telling us what's going on? Here I was with the elders of my church saying, why'd you go into the bar? 
And I said, well, guys, I've been asked to be the chaplain of this group. And I can't be their chaplain if I'm in the next room and I'm not with them. Jesus was accused of hanging around with sinners. That's what I'm doing, hanging around with sinners. I will tell you this, here in the last few weeks, this guy from the Qantas Club has started coming to church. I've had a chance to, to have a, a counseling session with this guy. Here's another family that has started coming to church directly because of that. I'm just using it for outreach and ministry. Amen. And they said, okay, we knew there was a good reason. Thanks for telling us. We're free to go. I hope and I pray that we would be a group of people <coughs> that are free from legalism and people that walk in Jesus Christ because Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the power of the gospel. Thank you that it sets us free. And I pray, Lord, that uh, today that maybe we've been stirred a little bit by how we've allowed legalism uh, and uh, uh, wrong thinking get into our heart. May we walk away from this place today renewed, restored, and free people. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two fifty-eight is our invitation again today. If anything is on your heart this morning, and you need to come forward, talk to the preacher, talk to me about anything in your life, about becoming a Christian. Uh, I was just thinking about what Luke said this morning, that uh, this is a praying church. Yeah. Um, and I want to know that you have strong faith when you pray. Sometimes people say, well, I prayed to God, but it didn't happen. Didn't answer my prayer. Well, maybe you're not being specific enough. If you just pray, God, I pray for the people in my church, God don't know what you're praying for. We need to pray for that man, for Butch, for Nelson, for Cheryl, that's going in to have procedures or going through whatever they're going through. Pray for them specifically when you pray. Then God can answer that prayer. That's what we need to think about when we pray. Pray prayer is not a hard thing if you have faith and you believe. Um, so we're going to stand and stand. Uh, 258. And like I said, if you have a need, God is here for you. <laughs> Come up here 
and we'll get a couple of people maybe to take some pictures, maybe put them on Facebook. Um, Jeff told me this morning what the party is, and people just love it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a word out there. That's what we're here for. So come on up here if you want to get your picture, maybe. You don't, that's okay. But I'm going to have prayer now, and we'll do that. Heavenly Father, what a great day that you've given us to be together, to hear of uh, your word in such a way that it opens so many doors in our lives that shows us how, why, and when, and what we need to do with our lives. Thank you, Lord, for, for your word, for the, the strength in your word and the strength that your word gives us. We pray, Lord, for each and every one here. We pray for a good, safe week. Um, and thank you, Lord, for all the people um, in churches all over the land that work to make um, your kingdom great. <clears throat> we just praise you and give you the glory for all things and everything in our life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.